Hello there, second grade. We are up to chapter 10 of our story, Little House in the Big Woods, and this one is called Summertime. Now it was summertime and people went visiting. Sometimes Uncle Henry or Uncle George or Grandpa came riding out of the big woods to see Pa. Ma would come to the door and ask how all the folks were and she would say, Charles is in the clearing. Then she would cook more dinner than usual and dinner time would be longer. Pa and Ma and the visitor would sit talking a little while before they went back to work. Sometimes Ma let Laura and Mary go across the road and down the hill to see Mrs. Peterson. The Petersons had just moved in. Their house was new and always very neat because Mrs. Peterson had no little girls to muss it up. She was a Swede. That means she's from Sweden. And she let Laura and Mary look at the pretty things she had brought with her from Sweden laces and colored embroideries and china. Mrs. Peterson talked Swedish to them and they talked English to her and they understood each other perfectly. She always gave them each a cookie when they left and they nibbled the cookies very slowly while they walked home. Laura nibbled away exactly half of hers and Mary nibbled exactly half of hers and the other halves they saved for baby Carrie. Then when they got home, Carrie had two half cookies and that was a whole cookie. This wasn't right. All they wanted to do was to divide the cookies fairly with Carrie. Still, if Mary saved half her cookie while Laura ate the whole of hers, or if Laura saved half and Mary ate the whole of hers, that wouldn't be fair either. They didn't know what to do. So they each just saved a half and gave it to baby Carrie because they always felt that somehow that wasn't quite, but they always felt that somehow that wasn't quite fair. Sometimes a neighbor sent word that the family was coming to spend the day. Then Ma did extra cleaning and cooking and opened a package of store sugar. And on that day, a wagon would come driving up to the gate in the morning and there would be strange children to play with. When Mr. and Mrs. Huat came, they brought Eva and Clarence with them. Eva was a pretty girl with dark eyes and black curls. She played carefully and kept her dress clean and smooth. Mary liked her, but Laura liked to play better with Clarence. Clarence was redheaded and freckled and always laughing. His clothes were pretty too. He wore a blue suit buttoned all the way up the front with bright gilt buttons and trimmed with braid and he had copper toed shoes. The strips of copper across the toes were so glittering bright that Laura wished she were a boy. Little girls didn't wear copper shoes. Laura and Clarence ran and shouted and climbed trees while Mary and Ava walked together and talked nicely. Ma and Mrs. Huat visited and looked at Godley's Lady Book, which Mrs. Huat had brought, and Pa and Mr. Huat looked at the horses and the crops, and they smoked their pipes. Here's a picture of Laura and Clarence climbing the tree. Once Aunt Lottie came to spend the day, that morning Laura had to stand still a long while while Ma unwound her hair from the cloth strings and combed into long curls. Mary was all ready, sitting primly on a chair with her golden curls shining and her blue china dress fresh and crisp. Laura liked her own red dress, but Ma pulled her hair dreadfully and her hair was brown instead of golden so that no one noticed it. Everyone noticed Mary's hair and admired it. There, Ma said at last, your hair is curled beautifully and Lottie is coming. Run and meet her, both of you, and ask her which she likes best, brown curls or golden curls. Laura and Mary ran out the door and down the path for Aunt Lottie was already at the gate. Aunt Lottie was a big girl, much taller than Mary. Her dress was a beautiful pink and she was swinging a pink sunbonnet by one string. Which do you like best, Aunt Lottie? Mary asked, brown curls or golden curls? Ma had told them to ask that and Mary was always a little girl, good little girl who did exactly as she was told. Laura waited to hear what Aunt Lottie would say. Inside, she felt miserable. I like both kinds best, Aunt Lottie said, smiling. She took Laura and Mary by the hand, one on either side, and they danced along to the door where Ma stood. The sunshine came streaming through the windows of the house and everything was so neat and pretty. The table was covered with a red cloth and the cook stove was polished shining black. Through the bedroom door, Laura could see the trundle bed in its place under the big bed. The pantry stood wide open, giving the sight and smell of goodies on the shelves, and Black Susan came purring down the stairs from the attic, where she had been taking a nap. 
It was all so pleasant and Laura felt so gay and good that no one would ever thought she could be as naughty as she was that evening. Aunt Lottie had gone and Laura and Mary were tired and cross. They were at the wood pile gathering a pan of chips to kindle the fire in the morning. They always hated to pick up chips, but every day they had to do it. Tonight, they hated it more than ever. Laura grabbed the biggest chip and Mary said, I don't care, Aunt Lottie likes my hair best anyway. Golden hair is lots prettier than brown hair. Laura's throat swelled tight and she could not speak. She knew golden hair was prettier than brown. She couldn't speak, so she reached out quickly and slapped Mary's face. Then she heard Pa say, come here, Laura. She went slowly, dragging her feet. Pa was sitting just inside the door. He had seen her slap Mary. You remember, Pa said, I told you girls, you must never strike each other. Laura began, but Mary said, makes no difference, said Pa. It is what I say that you must mind. Then he took down the strap from the wall and he spanked Laura with the strap. Laura sat on a chair in the corner and sobbed. When she stopped sobbing, she sulked. The only thing in the whole world to be glad about was that Mary had to fill the chip pan all by herself. At last, when it was getting dark, Pa said, come here, Laura. His voice was kind, and when Laura came, he took her up on his knee and hugged her close. She sat in the crook of his arm, her head against his shoulder, and his long brown whiskers parting, covering his eyes, and everything all right again. She told Pa all about it, and then she asked him, you don't like golden hair better than brown, do you, Pa? Pa's blue eyes shone down at her and he said, Well, Laura, my hair is brown. She had not thought of that. Pa's hair was brown and his whiskers were brown. And she thought brown was a lovely color. But she was glad that Mary had to gather all the chips. And there's Pa taking her up on his knee and hugging her. So... I know that sounds terrible to us, but they did spank children in those days. I mean, that's what they did. Okay. In the summer evenings, Pa did not tell stories or play the fiddle. Summer days were long, and he was tired after he worked hard all day in the fields. Ma was busy, too. Laura and Mary helped her weed the garden, and they helped her feed the calves and the hens. They gathered the eggs, and they helped make cheese. When the grass was tall and thick in the woods and the cows were giving plenty of milk, there was time to make cheese. Somebody must kill a calf, for cheese could be, not be made without rennet, and rennet is the lining of the young calf's stomach. The calf must be very young so that it has never eaten anything but milk. Laura was afraid that Pa must kill one of the little calves in the barn. They were so sweet. One was fawn colored and one was red and their hair was so soft and their large eyes so wondering. Laura's heart beat fast when Ma talked to Pa about making cheese. Pa would not kill either of his calves because they were heifers and they would grow up into cows. He went to Grandpa's and he went to Uncle Henry's to talk about cheese making and Uncle Henry said he would kill one of his calves. There would be enough run it for Aunt Polly and Grandma and Ma. So Pa went again to Uncle Henry's and came back with a piece of the little calf's stomach. It was like a piece of soft grayish white leather, all ridged and rubbed, rough on one side. When the cows were milked at night, Ma set their milk away in pans. In the morning, she skimmed off the cream to make it into butter later. Then when the morning's milk had cooled, she mixed it with the skim milk and set it on the stove to heat. A bit of the rennet tied in a cloth was soaking in warm water. When the milk was heated enough, Ma squeezed every drop of water from the rennet into the cloth, and then she poured the water into the milk. She stirred it very well, and she left it in a warm place by the stove. It was a little while. In a little while, it thickened into a smooth, quivery mass. With a long knife, Ma cut this mass into little squares and let it stand while the curd separated from the whey. Then she poured it all into a cloth and let the thin yellowish whey drain out. <clears throat> when no more whey dripped from the cloth, Ma emptied the curd into a big pan and salted it, turning it and mixing it well. Laura and Mary were always there helping all they could. They loved to eat bits of curd when Ma was salting it. It squeaked in their teeth. 
Under the cherry tree outside the back door, Pa had put up the board to press the cheese on. He had cut two grooves the length of the board and laid the board on blocks, one end a little higher than the other. Under the lower end stood an empty pail. Ma put her wooden cheese hoop on the board, spread a clean white cloth over the side of it, and, oh sorry, spread a wet cloth over the inside of it and filled it heaping full of the chunks of salted curd. She covered this with another clean wet cloth and laid that on top of the round board and cut enough to go inside the cheese hoop. Then she lifted a heavy rock on top of the board. All day long, the round board set slowly under the weight of the rock and the way pressed out and ran down the grooves of the board and into the pail. And the next morning, Ma would take out the round, pale yellow cheese, as large as the milk pan. Then she would make more curd and fill the cheese hoop again. Every morning, she took the new cheese out of the press and trimmed it smooth. She sewed a cloth tightly around it and rubbed the cloth all over with fresh butter. Then she put the cheese on a shelf in the pantry. Every day, she wiped every cheese carefully with a wet cloth and then rubbed it all over with fresh butter once more and laid it down on the other side. After a great many days, the cheese was ripe and there was a hard rind over the outside of it. Then Ma wrapped each cheese in paper and laid it away on the high shelf. There was nothing more to do but eat it. Laura and Mary liked cheese making. They liked to eat the curd that squeaked in their teeth and they liked to eat the edges Ma pared off of the big round yellow cheeses to make them smooth before she sewed them up in a cloth. And here's a picture of Laura helping Ma. And that's the contraption Pa set up. So the way drips down. Ma laughed at them for eating green cheese. The moon is made of green cheese, pump, some people say, she told them. The new cheese didn't did look like the round moon when it came up behind the trees, but it was not green. It was yellow like the moon. It's green, Ma said, because it hasn't ripened yet. When it's cured and ripened, it won't be green cheese. Is the moon really made of green cheese? Laura asked, and then Ma laughed. I think people say that because it looks like a green cheese, but appearances are deceiving. That means the way things look aren't always what you think, and it, they can sometimes trick you. Then while she wiped all the green cheeses and rubbed them with butter, she told them about the dead cold moon and that it is like a little world of its own on which nothing grows. The first day Ma made cheese, Laura tasted the way. She tasted it without saying anything to Ma, and when Ma turned around and saw her face, Ma laughed. That night while she was washing the supper dishes and Mary and Laura were wiping them, Pa told Ma told Pa that Laura had tasted the way and didn't like it. You wouldn't like to starve to death on Ma's way like old Grimes did on his paws, on his wife's pa said. Laura begged Pa to tell the story about old Grimes. So Pa, even though he was tired, took out his fiddle and played a sad song for Laura. Old Grimes is dead. That good old man will never see him more. He used to wear an old gray coat all buttoned down before. Old Grimes' wife made skim milk cheese. Old Grimes, he drank the whey. There came an east wind from the west and blew old Grimes away. There you have it. She was a mean, tight-fested woman. If she hadn't skimmed all the milk, a little cream would have run off in the way, and old Grimes might have staggered along. But she skimmed off every bit of cream, and that poor, that poor old Grimes got so thin that the wind just blew him away. He plumb starved to death. Then Pa looked at Ma and said, Ha, 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 nobody will starve to death when, we're, when you're around, Caroline. Well, no, Ma said. No, Charles, not if you're here to provide for us. Pa was pleased. It was all so pleasant, the doors and the windows wide open for the summer evening, the dishes making little cheerful sounds together as Ma washed them and Mary and Laura wiped and Pa putting away the fiddle and smiling and whistling softly to himself. 
After a while, he said, I'm going over to Henry's tomorrow morning, Caroline, to borrow his grubbing hoe. Those sprouts are getting waist high around the stumps in the wheat field. A man just has to keep everlasting at it or the woods will take over and take the whole place back again. Before I turn the page, I'll show you. That's old Grimes blowing away. He's so skinny. Because when you make the cheese skim, that means you take the heavy cream out of it. So it makes it, um, it just doesn't have as much weight to it or as much flavor. Early next morning, he started to walk to Uncle Henry's. But before long, he came hurrying back and hitched the horses to the wagon, threw in his axe, threw in two wash tubs, threw in the wash boiler and all the pails and the wooden buckets that were there. I don't know if I'll need them all, Caroline, but I'd hate to want them and not have them with me. What is it? What is it? Oh, what is it? Laura asked, jumping up and down with excitement. Pa has found a bee tree, Ma said. Maybe he'll bring us some honey. It was noon before Pa came driving home. Laura had been watching for him. She ran out to the wagon as soon as it stopped by the barnyard, but she could not see into it. Pa called out, Caroline, if you'll come take this pail of honey, I'll go unhitch. Ma came out to the wagon, disappointed. She said, well, Charles, even one pail of honey is something. Then she looked into the wagon and threw up her hands, and Pa laughed. Ha, ha, ha. All the pails and buckets were heaping full of dripping golden honeycomb. Both tubs were piled full, and so was the wash boiler. Pa and Ma went back and forth, back and forth, carrying the two loaded tubs and the wash bottle and all the buckets and pails into the house. Ma heaped a plate high with golden pieces and covered all the rest neatly with cloths. For dinner, they all had as much delicious honey as they could eat. And then Pa told them all about how he found the bee tree. I didn't take my gun, he said, because I wasn't hunting. And now it's summer and there isn't much danger of meeting trouble. Panthers and bears are so fat this time of year. They're lazy and good natured. Well, I took a shortcut through the woods and I nearly ran into a big bear. I came around a clump of underbrush and there he was, not as far away from me as across this room. He looked at me and I guess he saw I didn't have a gun. Anyway, he didn't pay any more attention to me. He was standing at the foot of a big tree and bees were buzzing all around him. They couldn't sting him through that thick fur and he just kept brushing them away with his head from his head with one paw. I stood watching him and put the other paw on the hole in the tree and drew it out all dripping with honey. He licked that honey off his paw and reached in for more. But by that time, I had found me a club. I wanted that honey myself. So I made a great racket, banging the club against a tree and yelling, ah! The bear was so fat and so full of honey that he just dropped down on all fours and waddled off among the trees. I chased him for some distance and got him going fast away from the bee tree. And then I came back from the wagon. Here's a picture of the bear at the tree. Laura asked him how he got the honey away from the bees. That was easy, said Pa. I left the horses back in the woods where they wouldn't get stung. And then I chopped the tree down and split it open. Didn't the bee sting you? No, bees never sting me, said Pa. The whole tree was hollow and it filled from top to bottom with honey. The bees must have been storing honey there for years. Some of it was old and dark, but I guess I got enough good clean honey to last us a long time. Laura was sorry for the poor bees. She said, they worked so hard and now they won't have any honey. But Pa said there was lots of honey left for the bees and that there was another large hollow tree nearby into which they could move. He said it was time they had a clean new home anyway. They would take the old honey he had left in the old tree and make it into fresh new honey and store it away in their new house. They would save every drop of the spilled honey and put it away again. And then they would have plenty of honey again long before winter came. So that chapter was called Summertime. I mean, it's amazing, you know, when you think about how close they were to the bears. But they understood the animals. Like, Pa knew that bear wasn't hungry, so he wasn't going to bother him. 
and Pa knew how to get the honey. And it's just amazing. They learned, they made cheese all by themselves and all the things they did all by themselves. Maybe you guys are doing more things by yourself now, like baking more, things that you can't, you're not going to the store as much to get. And um, post your comments. Let me know if you're doing anything. If you can make anything. Maybe you're making your own masks. I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. We only have a few chapters left. I think the book only has 14 chapters. Let's see. I know we're getting to the end, yeah. No, it only has 13 chapters. So we have three chapters left. So we'll finish up here soon. I really hope you're enjoying it. This is one of the best books. And then again, as I told you, there's a whole series. So you can read more of these books. All right, missing you all. Take care. Post your comments on Google Classroom. I love seeing what you write. Bye for now.